So I think we'll get started. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tom Banchoff. I serve as Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown and also as Director of our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. I'm really delighted to welcome you, as I said, to Riggs Library, which was, by the way, the University Library until around 1971, um, now just for ceremonial purposes and events, to this beautiful space for today's event on whose story to tell, writing about, for, and alongside children on the move. In a moment, I'll hand things over to my colleague Gillian Hubner, who will introduce our topic and our excellent speakers. But first, just a few words about the broader context for our gathering. As a Catholic and Jesuit university, Georgetown is committed to advancing scholarship, teaching, dialogue, and action around the pressing social justice issues of our day. And one of the most pressing, I'm sure you'll agree, is care for and protection of children. Children whose value and dignity we all experience and understand, but who nevertheless suffer in so many ways and so needlessly in our world, in our families, in our societies, in terms of access to and enjoyment of basic human goods, from education and health care to shelter, food, water, and of course, basic safety. And there's perhaps no group of children more vulnerable than children on the move, who represent about 40% of displaced people globally. Today, with some leading experts and practitioners, we'll have a chance to reflect on their plight, the plight of these children from fresh perspectives, to explore new ways to give them voice, new and creative ways to give them voice, and to envision concrete paths for addressing the challenges they face. The challenges, I think we all agree, their challenges, but also ours. We brought Gillian and the Collaborative on Global Children's Issues to Georgetown uh, about three years ago, precisely for events like this, to promote innovative thinking and also effective solutions in a critical area. She's very modest, so let me underscore, while I have the podium, what a remarkable record it's been, and really encourage you to learn more about the collaborative and its programs. In closing, I want to underscore that tonight's event is a very much a joint effort convened by the collaborative, the Berkeley Center and its Culture of Encounter Project, and the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, a valued Georgetown partner. So thank you all for coming, and please join me in welcoming Gillian and our speakers. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Georgetown. Thank you, Pulitzer Center, for creating opportunities like this. Um, we were in a, at an event this morning, and someone said, well, what are global children's issues? And we said, well, what aren't global children's issues? 50% of the world's population is under the age of 30. We have the largest child and youth population that the world has ever known. So anything that's affecting the world is, of course, affecting children. And we think about their vulnerability, but also their resilience. We were in a workshop um, last year with a former child soldier. And he said, if you're not involving children in your problem solving, you're missing 50% of the challenge, and you're also missing 50% of the solution. So that's sort of the framework that we work with. So one of the issues we've been dealing with uh, at Georgetown with a collaborative is children on the move, children who are experiencing displacement, migration, refugee status. Um, and we like to ensure that when we're delving into these issues, that we're not just talking about children, but that we're also involving them in our understanding of the issues. So earlier in uh, September, we had a full day workshop on children on the move that started with um, young people with lived experience talking directly to policymakers about what they thought they needed to know. And then policymakers got to respond. And then we talked about community-based perspectives. But today's con conversation is a little bit different because we're, we're dealing with um, media, research, and also practice. And the topic is narrative. Whose 
who gets to tell the story of children on the move? And when we don't involve children in their own storytelling about their lives, what do we miss? What's the risk of not including them as we talk about them? So here we are to delve into that today. And I'm really pleased um, to have Jamie Joyce with me. Jamie is a freelance writer and editor based in New York, hailed in on the train today. Um, she's been published in quite a few major outlets, including NPR and the New York Times. And she was an editor at Time Magazine and one of the editors for Time for Kids, which creates news for children. And she has, um, you're a four-time Pulitzer Center grantee with a project focusing on children with incarcerated parents and also children in refugee crises. Thanks for coming. And Gabriela Sanchez is one of ours. <laughs> no, she's a, a, a research fellow with a collaborative on global children's issues. Um, and she has a fascinating background, including in law enforcement. Um, she's a sociocultural anthropologist which, with research focusing on irregular migration, facilitation, and crimes related to migration. Um, and with a collaborative, she's been focusing a lot on children impacted by migration um, and their use of technology and, and has done a lot of actually fascinating, innovative research with children who facilitated smuggling. Um, so working with children as researchers. Yeah. Great to have you. Thanks for coming in. She's normally at the US-Mexico border, but we have her for the day. <laughs> And Patricia Meneses is a Mexican actress with over 20 years of experience in theater, radio, cinema, and television. And she is using theater currently in schools with newcomer youth to help them acclimate to their new environment and also to uh, tell their stories uh, as a way of processing everything that they've been through, but also to use their stories in such a way that they're building empathy within their school communities uh, and she's been working with Imagination Stage and the play Oyame, which means Hear Me in Spanish, which has been on tour and has made uh, some ripples in Congress and other environments. So thrilled to have you here as well. Um, so why don't we begin by talking about how we each got into this field, and not specifically just the field of migration, but the narrative aspect of it. Do you want to begin, Gabriela? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much to, to all of you for showing up, to Gillian, of course, for putting all of this together, so the collaborative, it is because of you that we are, that we are here, and to um, all of the, the staff that made it possible. So thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I think you already said, you know, how I got into it. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Mexico. I was born and raised in a very little town in central Mexico. I'm from a migrant family and I'm a migrant myself. Um, although sometimes I, I wonder, you know, if I am still a migrant after all of these years. Um, I was also, I'm a formerly undocumented person. And the very first job that I was able to obtain right after I was able to, um, to get my documents was in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, so it was conducting uh, investigations within detention facilities. And I held that job for seven years. And after that, um, it was very clear to me that there was this specific narrative about the border, uh, about the people who were in detention, about the people who were facilitating the journeys of those who, who travel. Um, that really didn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, because it really didn't coincide with the testimonies, with the, with the lived experience of the people that I was um, working with in the detention settings. So from law enforcement, I went into academia, um, and I've been there ever since. <laughs> Sometimes you're like, okay, I went from one prison to another. <laughs> um, but um, the work that I've been doing is, you know, I, I kind of like keep one foot in academia and another one very much into um, incidents and advocacy. So I'm, I'm based on the U.S.-Mexico border, and um, I continue working on the issues that are related to uh, research, ethics, and how, how we talk about giving people's voices mm -hmm. 
and what that actually means or tells about adults and not necessarily about the experiences of, of you know, not only of children, but just of, of, um, of the people that we often infantilize. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's where I am, I think, today, you know, just looking more critically into what that experience has been. And also many times reflecting on, you know, when, when I hear people talk about teenagers or when in, in school, right, we, we, read, we read about the experiences of, of migrant youth, I also reflect on this is on what that tells us about society and how we think about young people, you know, in, especially in these kinds of settings, policy, you know, um, academia, or even as practitioners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I do want to note um, on the event page on the website, we have a resources page where you can read some of their work and some guidance on this topic, which is really helpful, I think. Do you want to speak sure. about how you got into this? <laughs> sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for being, I'm so happy to be on this panel with both of you. Um, and thank you all for coming. I think I saw one kid here, which was really nice. I don't know where that kid went, but I was excited. But anyway, um, <laughs> my, <laughs> uh, my name is Jamie Joyce. Um, I got into this work initially as um, I was a teacher. I started my career as an elementary school teacher um, right out of college. I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to write, but I didn't think I could make a living with that. And then I did an internship at a school and I thought, I loved this, I love doing this. And so I taught for seven years. I taught um, at a public school in the East Village in New York City um, and at a private school, an independent school in Brooklyn called Brooklyn Friends, it was a Quaker school. Um, and then um, I went back to that um, school in the East Village where I had done my internship in college, which made me love teaching. It also made me realize I had to get out of teaching because um, it was seven years in and I was pretty tired. Um, <laughs> but it was, it's incredibly rewarding work. I loved it. I still love the opportunity to be able to work with kids, to go into schools and do visits, um, but I feel like the auntie. I get to go in and I get to leave. So <laughs> um, that's a nice thing, but it is really rewarding work. Um, but after I did that, I was trying to um, find a direction in writing, and ultimately I ended up at Time for Kids. Um, so it's Time Magazine's Kids Edition. Time started this magazine in 95, um, and so it's a, I'm currently there as a freelancer. I left my full-time position there uh, in May. Um, but I just got into this work with writing about kids and migration and refugees about 2018, and it was through an opportunity with the Pulitzer Center, um, and I'm so grateful for the Pulitzer Center for um, giving me that opportunity um, and providing the, the funding to be able to do it. Um, as you probably all know, media is shrinking. Media doesn't have a lot of money, um, and so it was so crucial for me to have that funding to be able to do reporting from Kenya. Um, and I visited a refugee camp in Kenya to learn about the lives of children who lived there, what that experience was like. And it was so eye-opening for me because one of the things that I didn't realize going into this was that kids, they weren't just passing through. You know, they were living there for years and years and years. Families were coming there and kids were born there, lived their whole lives there. They were now teachers in the schools there. And that was really transformative for me to see this experience and to hear about that and to, and to talk to kids there. Um, and so I was really, um, that really just spurred further, you know, spurred my interest and um, got me to do other projects. So that's my short story. I know we'll get to talk more, but yeah, thanks thank for you. having me. Mm -hmm. Patricia, Hi. what brought you to this? <laughs> well. Um, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. I'm Patricia Meneses. I'm an actress. I'm Mexican. And I think this topic, I was thinking when I, 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 I was hearing you, and I, I was raised in a little town in Mexico. The town is Atlisco Puebla. In that town, um, we grow with that stories. I have my friends who who left the town, our town, and 
and other friends, we, they were separated, the families were separated. And, and, and I, I was thinking about that, and, and the stories, it's, it's, they are, they come with me. And in, in one moment as a as student, I was a student in UNAM, in the Uni Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. Um, I was a student uh, politics and I didn't end <laughs> the, the, the career because I changed my, my way it was in the art as an actress. It's kind, more kind. <laughs> and in, uh, in Mexico, I, have, I had another experience um, as an actress. I participate in a commercial, um, a big commercial uh, with the topic in immigrant in, in Super Bowl in 2017. And I was the mom with a girl crossing the border and taking the train. And I, I, I could to experience and try to put on the shoes with the stories that I heard with my f friends when I grew up with them. And now I cross the border because, because I got married <laughs> for that. <laughs> and when I came to the United States, I didn't speak any English word. And, and now teaching with the students and immigrants, uh, children, I can em empathize with them because they have s a lot of issues with the language, like me. <laughs> and I can, I can say to them, well, 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 we can do it, kids, we can, we can do it. We can cross the language and, and think, think we can raise or reach our dreams. Um, and for that, I think we, I, I, I can help um, with my art, uh, changing, changing the stories or, or their, their narratives, and help them to express their feelings, their emotions, their, their, their thoughts, their thing, yeah. Thank and you. thank you for <laughs> the invitation. <laughs> if you don't understand, please, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So Gabriela, you, um, we've talked quite a bit about this, where in academia there are all these, you know, there's the IRB, they don't want to talk, they don't want you talking to anybody under 18, and you're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> how, how has that worked? What, what, do you, what do we miss when we don't involve, when we do research that excludes young people, especially if we're researching situations that affect them? So what are the risks, but also the opportunities? What do you learn that you wouldn't learn if you weren't engaging the young people you're studying? Okay. How much time do I have? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think, you know, really briefly about, you know, as an academic within the IRB, because I assume that, you know, several people here are probably going through their thesis or at some point had to deal with that process. And we really want to work with children, right? But one of the first things that, uh, that we're told is like, oh, if you're talking about vulnerable populations, you should stay away from them. You cannot engage them because who knows what may happen to them. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and sometimes protection concerns are not necessarily the concerns of the children, but those of the universities. Mm -hmm. um, there's more. There's more of this focus on liability issues or protection, or how 
how the how institutions many times can be affected you know, by carrying out this research. On the work that we do on the border, um, so I work with a local organization called DIA the, in Ciudad Juarez, it's Derechos Humanos Integrales en Acción. And nine years ago, and this actually started here in DC when I was, I was a professor at Catholic U, and we first started to hear about children who were being apprehended by um, US Customs and Border Protection on the border and brought to detention facilities in the DMV area. Um, and you know, again, when we wanted to, do, when I wanted to do this as part of, of research, like these children are being here, uh, are being held uh, with no access to counsel. What you know? What can we do for them? And immediately it was like, no, but you you cannot really touch that. It's too political. It's too dangerous. Um, and you, you don't really want to get into child protection issues. And you know, we've been doing when we have been working with the children. This is going to be our ninth year. Um, journalists often come to the border, you know, with this idea that they are going to unmask and identify everything that is happening. They come looking for the mafias, um, and they come like, oh, can you, you know, just, can you be my, my broker? Can you get me access to the kids? Because, you know, I really want to know what they are going through. But then we also have academics that come, but we need the data. We really need the data for this project. Mm -hmm. And then we have the policymakers, right? They're like, no, we're going to take this message back to DC and we're going to, you know, convince everyone. Nobody has ever come to the border to say, can we just hang out with the kids? Mm -hmm. Can we just spend time with them? Mm -hmm. Can we just know what they, what they, are, what they go through, what they are actually doing? Mm -hmm. And this already shows you, you know, all of these hierarchies that are, in, are are part of research. This is how we are trained to do research. Mm -hmm. We are told that as researchers, we're at the top, mm -hmm. that there's this hierarchy and the children are very much at the bottom. This is not necessarily, and, and this is you know, perhaps a very, very straight criticism to research, but we infantilize children. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, then we don't necessarily need to engage what they are actually saying or what they have to, or what they think. Um, so one solution here, one, one, of the, one of the ways in which we have been trying to, to look more closely into this issue is, well, you know, if we really want to do research, why don't we train mm -hmm, young people to do research mm -hmm, so that they can come up with the questions so that they can ask all of us as academics, as policy makers, as professors, mm -hmm, um, as practitioners, you know, so that they can ask us the, the, the questions, you know, so that they can be part uh, of the development of all of these tools and all of these um, inquiries into their into what they, what they are and what they do, um, I think that people as adults, right? Often we go into communities around the world thinking that oh well, that we are the experts or that we are bringing the knowledge to the people, without necessarily knowing or acknowledging the fact that the knowledge is already there. Mm -hmm. You know. We are not, we don't have to, we don't have to bring knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, the expertise is local. Mm -hmm. And so by, I think that by, by reversing the power that is implicit you know, in Western ways of doing research, of conducting policy or carrying out humanitarian work, mm -hmm, we can, I'm not saying that we're gonna make it mm -hmm, less problem, that, we're gonna make, that, we're gonna, that we are going to make research less problematic. Mm -hmm but we are going to challenge some of these hierarchies mm -hmm, that are, are very much connected to the way in which we do research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a follow-up question, but maybe we'll get to that after we... <laughs> um, it's so interesting to actually... Uh, we, we get calls all the time from journalists who want to speak to Gabriela because she knows something that not everybody knows because she actually listens to children. Um, and then she tells them what she's learned about children who smuggle other children. And they rarely want to publish her <laughs> perspective because it's not, it doesn't fit into the national narrative. Which, so that's a really interesting thing. When you really listen, are you prepared to be changed by what you're hearing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speaking of this, if you're on the journalist side calling me to get access <laughs> to Gabriela, no. Um, but you. So the news that we read yeah. about children who are migrating affects us, and it also affects the children. Yeah. 
So how do you navigate that as somebody who's trying to do justice? Yeah. How do we become child sensitive news consumers? Good question. Um, the work that I've done at Time for Kids is, you know, I've been writing for kids, about kids on the move, you know, writing directly to that audience. You know, my audience at Time for Kids, these aren't adults. Although I should say that at Time for Kids, you know, it's a, it's a magazine that goes to schools. Teachers subscribe to it. So your audience really is parents, it's teachers, and it's the kids. So there's these three groups there. But really, the stories are written for children. And I always tried to approach the stories that I worked on and, and with, with my editors working together with them to really think about, um, we, we knew kids, we know kids hear about these things. We know kids see these, you know, they see what's going on in the world. And we really felt like, we've always felt like we want to involve kids in this conversation. Kids are smart. I respect kids a lot. Um, I think um, they have great questions and great insight. And, and I think by telling those stories directly to them, we really do them a service. And we help them be part of these conversations. And so, gosh, um, back to your question, how do we do this? Um, a lot of, I think we're gonna talk a lot about this later in this conversation too, just sort of like techniques for working with kids. But um, when I was in Kenya on my first reporting trip, um, and then in Bangladesh at the Rohingya refugee camps, and then later on the border, I went to, um, it was in Honduras, and then on the border, sort of doing a story about push-pull factors of migration. Um, I was really spending as much time as I could with kids, but also talking to their teachers, talking to the adults in their lives, whether it was teachers, um, you know, aid workers at the refugee camps, um, and learning from them first and then just really sitting back and observing what was going on with kids before I really even had any interaction directly with kids. Um, so how do we, there aren't a lot of places, there aren't a lot of outlets that are doing work directly for kids. Um, Time for Kids is one of the last ones. Washington Post had a kids section for a long time that just closed, which is unfortunate. Um, but there's a few places still doing this work and I think it's really important. Um, and we really think, always so much about what's age appropriate for kids, what kind of questions they'll have. Um, and so that really guides a lot of the reporting and the, the, res the, the work that I've done. Um, so, Thank you. yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I remember my kids used to come home with time for kids once <laughs> a week, and I loved it because that's actually what got me. I mean, you, you know, when you're a parent and you're driving in the car and you're listening to the news and you hear about 9-11 or Sandy Hook or Israel, Gaza, and you're driving your kid to school or to gymnastics, you're like, oh God, my kid's hearing the news. <laughs> and you start thinking about this in a way that you never did before you had kids. And so the Time for Kids magazine actually was really helpful for me as a parent of young kids, like, okay. And I was a child-focused person, but it, it, it helps to frame that. And, and what I also find so interesting is when, you're, when you are driving your kid, and you hear the news, and then you have dinner with your child, your, your child may have pretended that they weren't listening to the news, right? But of course they were. Yep. And then if you actually have space at your dinner table conversation to say, how did that land? What do you think? Or they'll start asking you questions that also completely flip your worldview. Why is this okay? Why is it okay to bomb these people? But, you know, it's, it's they dynamic. They pick up yeah. on all of these things, mm -hmm. and it's true. There's not a lot of guidance out there. And so, again, I'll point you to the resource page because there's guidance from the DART Center, for instance. You know, how do you talk to children about these traumatic events without traumatizing them? How do you have young people who've been in terrible situations, like young children who were deported from Ukraine to Russia and then have come and talking to Congress, how do you do that in a way that allows them the dignity to tell their story, but also doesn't use them, exploit them, re-traumatize them? These are all very delicate things that we often don't think about, but are so critical given the state of our world. So Patricia, you, Oyame, this play that you've been involved with, acting on, uh, it's 
as you mentioned, it's, it's a tool you're using in schools where newcomer youth are encouraged to share their stories, but then they also see the stories acted out in front of them and with their school communities. And what you see, um, I've had the privilege of, of seeing this play performed in schools, and you can see the pride of the young newcomer students who see their story being told and they're not hiding behind it. They're not, they're not, somebody else is acting it, so they're protected, their identity is protected. But you can see the recognition when they see their story told well. But you also see the change in the audience. Students who may be from the host community who go, oh yeah, there are a lot of immigrants in my school, but they don't necessarily know their stories. And then after seeing the play, they think, they see these students differently. They see these students as heroes who've had a, a very powerful journey and who've learned a lot on the way. And the interaction in the school community changes, which is an incredibly powerful process of narrative. So can you tell us a little bit about that and the, how you're working with narrative and empathy and mental well-being for both the students you're working with who are newcomers but also the host communities? Um, with the Oyeme play, the performance, uh, we can tell their stories, our stories, with the audience here in the United States, in the Washington and Maryland schools. And I can, I could say, um, I can, I can see the change, and they can, the audience can empathize with the stories and they can say, oh my God, yeah, I have uh, some friends, some, some students that I saw in the pasillos. <laughs> in the pas hallways. Hallways, mm -hmm. in los pasillos. And I didn't, I didn't know they passed for that uh, issues, for those issues, for those uh, troubles. And one of them is the language. <laughs> and one of them is get friends, get a community, and have um, understand the, the teachers, <laughs> because some, a lot of class has in, have in, in, in English and they don't speak, they don't speak English. And with the, after the, the play, usually we have a workshop with them and we put on uh, some challenge and tell me what did you, in one word, what did you feel with the stories? And now, what do you what do you think with the stories? Um, I think it's a successful play, and I have to say this: um, I, I we have one experience in in one schools. We have to say uh, when at the end of the show, after at the end of the workshop when we have another play that day. And when I, when I, when I, when we were uh, cleaning the space and the well, sitting in las butacas, in las sillas, we found beans. In one row, we found beans. To me, it was so painful because that means that was to me too. And I think we need to work. Tenemos que trabajar, claro, y estamos en eso. It's like hard work para que esto no suceda y sensibilizar. Perdón, sorry. Gabriel, you can. We need to. We need to work together. We need to um, sensitize. Mm -hmm. 
to work towards sensitizing the, the community. Mm -hmm. The community, um, para que esto cada vez suceda menos y cada vez la gente empatice más con las historias eh, de muchos que venimos aquí. So that this doesn't happen as often and people empathize, um, people's you know, empathy you know, increases about the, about the stories of those who come here. Yeah, but that was in one school. In another school, yeah, that the play was successful and we can see the change. Uh, and they can express uh, they didn't know the, the stories of the, the children, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we also have um, three clips from Oyeme on the resource page, which is really beautiful to watch. One of the things that I really appreciate about the play is that it, it follows the child on the whole migration journey. So it begins in the country of origin, where the child and the family are acknowledging that the child has to leave for his or her own safety. And then you see the, the second clip is on the migration journey and how these young people are bonding together to kind of navigate the challenges and give each other advice and support. And the third clip is when they're in the United States and how it feels, you know, after pushing yourself to go through all of this and you kind of have this image of what the United States will be when you get there and then you get there and it's different and, and there are different responses. And I, I think OMA also does a beautiful job of uh, showing that this experience is not the same for every child, right? Not every kid who goes through this comes out in the same way. Um, and talking about the diversity of those experiences rather than child migrants, you know, as defined as one giant group in the news or in the political speech. Um, it really humanizes the... And I, I think Ojeme, it's, it's a beautiful program. I love working there because it's not just the play. It's, 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 we are working with the schools teaching art and we can approach, we can engage with them directly and try to hear the stories directly and try to, I, I don't want to say teach, but try to, to guide how they can express their emotions, their feelings, their ideas, and they feel, that they feel free that say loud their stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the right to express. I mean, that's a, you know, the Convention on the Rights of the Child talks about the right to participate. So every child has the right to participate in any matter affecting them to share their opinion. Um, and yet we don't practice that generally. So that's sort of an interesting thing if you, um, so I'm mindful of the time because this is pretty short, but we have a reception after where we can talk more individually. But since we're at a university and people are training to go out into the world to do all sorts of different things, um, what kind of training do we need? I mean, I'll speak for myself. I've spent the past 25 years working in the field of global child rights and protection. I was not trained in it initially. I went to the field, I got a job with the UN, and then I encountered child soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I realized nothing, nothing in my very good training had prepared me to work with child soldiers. And so ever since then, I've been like, okay, wait, let's back up. What do we need to learn? How do we make sure that people are equipped to deal with the youngest half of the population when they get out into the world to serve. What do we need to do at the university level? What training can we do? Gosh. Um, what would have helped? <laughs> well, you know, we talked about this when we were planning for this, for this event. And so, you know, I was saying, well, I was a teacher, but I, I was trained to work with kids, but not with kids in these kinds of situations. I mean, nothing can prepare you for that. Um, one of the things that really helped me, and the, we included some of these resources on the, um, on the event page, 
was the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. And I found that to be incredibly helpful. And I refer back to them consistently in my work. You know, I need a little reminder. I'm going out and doing some reporting. I need a little reminder. And there's one particularly good one on there that I like a lot. It's from John Woodrow Cox at the Washington Post. And he really just talks about, um, he did a, a piece on gun violence, kids affected by gun violence in the, in the US. And he just really broke it down so beautifully about how to just how to be with kids. You know, we're not just coming in and all of a sudden just sitting down and, and interviewing them. You know, it's a process. It's a slow roll. You know, you don't, you kind of, you need to help them feel comfortable. And we also need to really sit with them and explain what we're doing. You know, they're, not, they're kids. Um, whether they're you know, really young or teenagers, they're still children. And so I think it's so important that we get this training of how to do this work. Um, so DART Center, I think, is a great resource. Um, um, that, again, I, I, I return to that time and again. I think it's incredibly helpful. Yep. Mm -hmm. I agree. And Time for Kids is a great resource, too. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we always did at Time for Kids was include resources for teachers and parents mm -hmm. so that they can have um, ideas they can have some guidance on how to talk to children who, when they're reading these stories. Um, so that's just another another angle to this for sure. Mm -hmm. Gabriela, what would you say? I'm in writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never received training to work with children. You know, in in my during my academic um, training. You know, in graduate school, and. Um, and I think this is, this is, again, goes back to the way in which we think about research. Mm -hmm. um, this notions of protection, you know, that, at the, that where adults are at the center you know, of, of anything that we do in the field as researchers. Mm -hmm. So I think that one, one element is to question precisely how we engage with people in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, or th this, you know, thing that we call the field, when we actually go and carry out, and carry out research you know, within, within a specific communities. Um, also, as, as a student, as a researcher, identify people within the IRB office, mm -hmm. other researchers that are working, um, and there's, there's, there, you're going to find allies, mm -hmm. people who are going to help you work, um, I'm not saying avoiding mm -hmm, the, the regulations or the mechanisms that are in place at the university, but identifying how, what to, how to create ways and pathways towards you know, building a more equitable to kind of like flatten the, the, um, the landscape in a sense too, to carry out the, the research with, um, with kids. And I think that um, also go into any kind of interaction um, that is research centered aware of the fact that research, that the way we practice this, is intended to be extractive. Mm -hmm. We want to, you know, all of your professors, you know, as a professor, sometimes we're like, where's your data? <laughs> mm -hmm. Go and go, go get more data, go do more interviews. Mm -hmm. As if we were just going for data. Mm -hmm. As if the, the actual interaction with the people in the field did not exist. Mm -hmm. So again, questioning those relationships in the field, questioning the hierarchy, and asking people, mm -hmm. that, that's another thing you know, that I think we, we often forget. Like, how did, if I, if you were, if I was, if you were interviewing me, mm -hmm. how would you, you know, how would you work? How would it work? How would you feel interviewing me? You know, which is something that we're not used to doing when we go to the field because, hey, I come from a fancy university because I have a degree, because I'm a professor, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm an expert. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, like questioning all of these labels mm -hmm. and trying to, and, and finding the people in the field who can help you. And again, trying to, you're going into a very unequal, unequal field. Mm -hmm. So challenging you know, those perspectives uh, and becoming more informed about how how the community also feels about the presence of researchers, and again, how children feel about engaging with you, I think is very important. <laughs> well, I think one the most important is they they don't need to feel judged, Jen. Um, because sometimes they don't don't feel free to say 
the reality because they say, oh no, you are gonna judge me. You are gonna uh, tell me something that I am bad. And they, they don't feel comfortable to say uh, the the things, the ideas, the, the t their stories, like uh, like like the reality, como es como son en realidad, uh, feels comfortable them and try to, yeah, I, I think I am I mean, I'm I agree with 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 Gabriela, no say. Uh, Crear, creating the the environment and the space when you are interviewing them uh, as we are um, in the same equality in the in, in el mismo nivel estamos en el mismo nivel the same level you and me and I, I'm not here because I am wine I, I I want to save you. No, I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Gabriella mentioned, you know, just being in school and you, you weren't trained to work with kids. And I was just thinking, you know, I went to graduate school for journalism and I don't recall having any classes that really talk specifically about interviewing kids, reporting on kids. And that is something, I don't know if, if that must exist somewhere. I hope it does. But if it doesn't, um, it should because it's so important. Well, we are trying to do that at the collaborative. <laughs> so, you know, like, um, in fact, you know, I'm supposed to be working on it. No. But <laughs> um, that is something that, that is, I think, at the core of the center, uh, at the core of the work that we do at the collaborative. You know, we also have another one of the fellows here, Sueta. Mm -hmm. And there's so much um, knowledge, you know, again, that is that comes from, from people in the collaborative across the university that have been working with children, you know, and again, trying to, you know, becoming more aware of these disparities mm -hmm. and how to, how, how to, and, and again, being aware that we're never going to be able to completely level the field, mm -hmm, reduce the, the impact of inequality when it comes to research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of like once you see it, you can't unsee it, you know, where children are missing in all, in conversations about, and in training, um, so, that's our sort of charge to you, you know, when you go read the news. Is this child sensitive reporting? Is a child's voice represented? Who represented it? Is the child's voice actually in it? Um, how is this depicting children? Is it even talking about children? Um, it's a pretty fascinating exercise that can become kind of addictive. <laughs> so we have some time for questions and then we can also continue out in the reception. Anyone have Amy? Yeah. I wanted to just tie together a few threads because it was it was very interesting to hear you all talk about working with children when they are children, you know, as as adults working with them. But I think one of the things that the Pulitzer Center has done is also work on the pipeline of creating the next wave of journalists. So I was wondering if you could just all reflect on how we go from working with children, you know, as adults and with them being the subject of the news or the interview um, subjects, but then helping them see journalism as a way to tell their own stories, both now as, as children, but maybe later on in life. So I was just curious to see what your reactions and thoughts are about that. I also love that question because I think, I, when I think of, when I was a child, I had so much respect for the news industry. And I think like my kids don't. They don't trust it. So that's also a really interesting dynamic, like how the, how even the creation of news feels for kids. But go ahead and answer Amy's question rather than going down my rabbit hole. <laughs> I think we, we can't generalize, generalize the kids, the children, because a, a kid, ¿A qué niños queremos? O sea, hay, hay, hay niños que no escuchan las noticias, hay padres que no escuchan las noticias en el auto, as your experience, driving with your parents, hearing the, listen the, the, the news, 
um, there's a lot of parents, they don't have time to listen to the news. And some, a lot of kids, they don't have uh, that knowledge and privilege to the get that uh, ese tipo de, de cosas. I think we, we can't generalize for that. We can't generalize. And we have to to create ways to to uh, engage uh, engage different uh, communities. that I might not be answering your question exactly, um, but I can say that um, at the Pulitzer Center, I've also done work with the Campus Consortium uh, Partnership and also done a lot of virtual visits for kids. Um, so these are virtual journalist visits, and so anybody can call up the Pulitzer Center, contact them and say, hey, we want to talk about this issue or we want to learn about journalism, and you can have a journalist speak to your class, and I think that you know, I've, I can only speak to my own experience, but I've met with lots of classes across the country, different ages from like kindergarten to college level. And it is really interesting the questions that young people have and what they want to know about how news is made. And so I think that's an important discussion that we need to be having with young people is how do we do this work? Um, and how, how does it get done? And how do we um, participate in it? So it kind of answers your question, I think, um, but it, it's a good one. And you've been working with child reporters. I mean, some of them have been, yeah. Have been, you know, um, they've been writing their, their stories. And I'm, I'm going to go back to something that Patty said, said earlier. Uh -huh. Their stories come with me. They already have their stories. And they've been telling, and communities have been telling their stories forever outside of, of you know, of traditional mm, journalistic channels. Um, and this is also why sometimes, you know, I'm 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 frustrated by the by the approach, you know, of mainstream media coming in to tell because we want to tell their story. They don't need you to come and tell their story. <laughs> mm -hmm. We don't need media to come to the border to tell our story. We are so, we are. We don't like the media coming to the border, I was going to say, <laughs> you know, because they want to tell their story. They are not telling, you know, they are not telling the story of my community. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about the river. They don't want to talk about joy. They don't want to talk about friendships. They don't want to talk about the desert, which we love in, at night. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so I think that, in, but building partnerships. You know, I think that is, is very important. There was just a, a report that came out on the um, t on the 23rd. It's going to be the first anniversary of the um, um, the fire in Ciudad Juarez, you know, where 40 migrants um, were uh, died, you know, as a, as a result of migration enforcement. Um, and Lighthouse Reports, you know, just published a couple of days ago this incredible report on what actually happened at this detention facility. And what I appreciated about that effort was that they came to the border, mm -hmm. they hired local journalists mm -hmm, who were fluent in Spanish and who were not afraid of going to Ciudad Juarez and to come back into El Paso, mm -hmm, because that's the other concern. Many people come to, come, come to El Paso and say, oh, but I don't go to Juarez, mm -hmm. it's too dangerous. They kill women there. <laughs> like, no, no me cuy, no me diga. <laughs> really, I didn't know, <laughs> you know. So when um, building partnerships mm -hmm, that take into consideration the knowledge that exists on the ground and then again approach the children as legitimate interlocutors mm -hmm, mm -hmm, changes the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, again, it's not, you know, again, people telling our story. We are, we are in that story. We, can, we are the ones that... Here are we, this proverbial we, but you know, people from the border or people from the from border communities can be the ones that you, they don't need to be told their story, mm -hmm. which is what has been happening, you know, in the context of the border. But I'm going into the border, and I better stop because <laughs> Gabriel also, also works in Europe and Africa and the Middle East, but she's especially attached to the border. I Understandable. The border. Please yeah. come to see us at the border. The other way, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, I. With that stories you you I heard with my one my student and I'm gonna talk in Spanish, please help me. 
<risa> um, él me contó que su camino desde que salió de su casa cruzó la frontera sur de México, probó comida deliciosa. Um, I want to tell you about my student who, you know, he crossed the border, you know, the Mexico southern border, and he crossed the border and he tried fabulous food. <laughs> yeah. Cruzó el, el río eh, en una balsa y yo pensé que ese era el momento más difícil de su camino. He crossed the border on a raft and I thought that must have been the hardest part of his journey. Cuando yo le pregunté qué fue lo más difícil que tú pasaste, me dijo cuando eh, la policía de migración me detuvo, yo pensé que ya estaba a salvo. Y cuando me llevaron a la casa hogar y pasé dos meses en esa casa hogar de este lado de Estados Unidos, dos meses sin saber si era de día o de noche, Cheese, cheese. Mm -hmm. yeah. cheese is not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to break it up a little. Let me interrupt you. No, please. But please. So, and he crossed the river. You know, he crossed the river on a raft. And when I asked him what was what the most, what the hardest part of the journey had been, he said being on the American side of the border and being brought into the in, into into the shelter, into the casa hogar, and spending two months in there without knowing if it's day or night con el frío, pasando frío, pasando eh, incertidumbre de no saber si iba a regresar a su hogar o si iba a reunirse con su familia. Um, facing the uncertainty without knowing if he was going to be able to go back home or if he was going to be able to reunite with his family. And then I, I, I want to say with this story that the story is just doesn't end in when they cross the border. Continuing here, there's a lot of, I think there's, there are a lot of issues, troubles and problems we can focus here too. And successes. And successes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we are at time, but I would suggest we continue out in the reception if that's good with you. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully you will open up your Washington Post tomorrow and see where the children are. <laughs> If you don't find them, call the editor <laughs> and come back for more conversations like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.